Hey Internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And on this week's show, a question about sanctification. I don't understand the words you just said. Or being holy and what it means, especially in the Old Testament. So, uh, stick around. I have all the answers. Hi, Pastor Fisk. Hi, everybody. Question on sanctification. In the Old Testament, they had a ritual to cleanse from ritually unholy, unclean, to clean. So as Jesus touched lepers, etc., would he have needed to be ritually cleansed afterwards? Not sin, but cleanness. Thank you. Really cool question. Lots of depth we can get into here. First and foremost, the last part about not to sin, but uncleanness. The fact is that uncleanness is sin. That's the whole point. The reason that these things were being called unclean was to demonstrate the depth of sin as making us unclean before God. So like when God sees sin, it's like when you see bacteria growing in your toilet bowl and you're like, ah, unclean, unclean, unclean. unclean. scrub it off, kill it, it's bad, right? I mean, that's God's response to evil. He, he's good and he doesn't like evil. Good gods do that. There's only one good God, but you get the point. An evil God wouldn't do that. So he wants to destroy evil wherever he finds it. So yes, in the Old Testament, though, uncleanness, even if it like wouldn't be a moral sin, was sin within the context of the Old Covenant. Now, the Old Covenant was incomplete and was pointing forward to the New Covenant, but we don't want to dismiss it, right? So, for example, the woman who Jesus cleanses the blood flow from when she touches his cloak that was in the Mark readings a couple weeks back, she was sinful in that uncleanness. She was unable to participate in the sacrifices of the temple to get even into the court of the women because she was permanently, ritually sinful. And that was to demonstrate, really, the fact that all of us are, in fact, permanently, ritually sinful with regard to the final and ultimate temple, the kingdom of God in heaven. So it wasn't like it was unfair. What's unfair is that some people got in at all. What's unfair is that grace happens at all. I can just push it, push it, have it. What's unfair is that some people got in at all. What's unfair is that grace happens at all. Think about it, though. But what we don't want to miss here is how sanctification in the Bible is most definitely about the definition or the distinction between clean and unclean. And in this, then, less about what we do, that is, uh, less about our righteousness. Now, the righteousness and obedience of both mankind and of the Christian are important topics in the Scriptures, but the way that the Scriptures generally refer to the word sanctification isn't about that righteousness. That's what justification and righteousness are referring to. Sanctification is about how clean we are, and how clean we are is directly related to how close we are to God. So if you want to talk about sanctification or holiness in the Old Testament, it is about proximity to God. Literally, physically, distance between you and God himself in the Ark of the Covenant. And you could only get close enough to him based on how many rituals you did to ritually clean you so that you would not be burned to a crisp by your native and inherent uncleanness, your inherent rebellion against him, which, of course, affects your lack of righteousness as well, right? But it wasn't just that, that we are distant from God, physically speaking, by means of our spiritual rebellion against him. And so the Old Testament has all of this hoopla you got to go through in order to try to get close to God again, and yet you never really can get close enough except for to throw some blood on his box. Now, all of this comes to pass and to bear when Christ himself then comes out of the holy temple of heaven and comes near to us, that, that God comes to be with us, Emmanuel, that now mankind in his essence has been made holy by taking taking on the ultimate proximity to God, being taken into the Godhood and becoming truly the Holy One of Israel, the only sanctified One of Israel. And by that, it doesn't mean the only righteous one, although it's that too, right? Don't get me wrong. I'm all for righteousness. Yay, righteousness. Yay, good works, right? But what I don't want us to miss is that the awesomeness of holiness isn't righteousness. It's its own thing. It is nearness and proximity to God himself, that in Jesus as a person, this happens to humanity, and now to you as human, you get brought into that humanity, take and eat, holy supper, holy things for the holy people, people made holy by Jesus. Jesus' proximity, God's proximity to you by the virtue of his body and blood shed for you on the cross. You hear what I'm saying? Like, do you see the distinction? The issue here is what is holiness as an idea distinct from righteousness? Righteousness is a good thing. We definitely are unrighteous, sinful, and unclean. We are made righteous, passively justified by grace through faith, and yet this faith does produce the fruits of righteousness, righteous deeds, and righteous acts. But holiness is nearness to God, and that isn't done by our good deeds. Our good deeds do not bring us near to God. If we're near God, will we do good? Yes, this is true, right? If we're holy, will we also be righteous? Yes, this is true. But that holiness is a matter of physical distance. And the beauty of it is that that too is being given to you by grace, particularly through the word and sacraments of Jesus, that you who are unholy and unclean, who have no right to enter the eternal kingdom of God, have the eternal God coming out of that kingdom to you by word and sacrament, making you holy, declaring you holy, making you clean in the fact that he's actually present with you, right? That you are, as you walk away from church, having
having been brought near to God himself in his presence. And this is kind of weird. So think about it this way. The pastor, when he is consecrating the elements of the Lord's Supper for like the briefest moment is more holy than you. Not because he's better than you. Has nothing to do with righteousness. He's just closer to the bread and the wine. But he's doing it for the sake of and in the office to turn around and make you equally holy because we are participating in the Holy One, the only Holy One, the true God who is man, Jesus, the one of Israel who's come to save us. Is this making sense? I sure hope so. Uh, yes. So now, finally, the question, did when Jesus touched lepers, did he have to be ritually cleaned afterwards? And this is the miracle of what goes on when he touches the leper. The reason that when you would touch a leper, you became ritually unclean is because the dirtiness of the leper would get on you, and you'd have to have a way to get the dirtiness of the leper off of you before you could go and be near to God. But this is just it. When Jesus touches lepers, the dirtiness doesn't come off on him. The clean comes off on them. Whoa. So no, Jesus did not need to be ritually cleansed from those ritually unholy things he would have been coming into contact with, even though he did always keep the law according to the letter of the law. So for example, he is circumcised on the eighth day because he's keeping the law in our place. But when, as God in man, his holiness just flows out from himself, his being the real Ark of the Covenant just flows out from himself and cleanses those around him, he doesn't have to be purified from his own cleanness. He's clean. He's purifying everything that he touches. This then too is what's so awesome when it all comes forward to this take and eat here is my cleanness given to you so that the unrighteousness which is the actual sin right the actual unholiness of us is demonstrated ultimately in our unrighteousness that then is purified cleansed made righteous without our works by his cleanness given to us does this result in our good works yeah how can you bear enjoying hatred if you really believe you've been forgiven you hate your own hatred more than anybody else hates you so you know it's just a, it's a different question but when it comes to sanctification and just, just kind of rethink this as you read through the New Testament and understand that sanctification and righteousness are two different things. Now, the word sanctification in our confessions does at times get used to mean righteousness, and that's fine, and we can use it that way. But as you're reading the New Testament, don't just assume that's the way it's being used. Look for the proximity, the nearness physically to God in the text. And you're going to be like, whoa, that's really, really cool. And then when it talks about how the one who has been made holy actually does good works, it's not like that's wrong, right? That's right too. But the holiness is not a matter of the good works. The holiness is the thing that produces the good works. You being made clean by being brought near to Jesus will in fact produce the fruit of righteousness. Yeah, it's it's kind of sweet. Anyway, thanks for the question. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what we do at World View Everlasting, you know the drill. You five bucks a month makes the show even better than it is. I promise. I swear. Just five bucks, please, please. I won't use it to buy coffee. I promise. I do. It's. I don't get. A, I don't get a dime. Can I have a dime? Pay that man his money. I don't want a dime. A dime's not worth much. Monetary policy. Let's not talk about that. Five bucks a month makes the show happen. Trust me. 501c3 still haven't heard. Uh, maybe we'll hear by the time this is out. That would be really nice. But even so, we're building that momentum toward a bigger thing. And Lutheran Ninja Clan, thanks for tuning in. Why are you still watching? The show's over. Oh, you think I'm going to say it again? You know how tired I am of saying it. It's kind of like, oh, what's that movie? It's the movie with Tim Allen that's about space and be, and Star Trek. It's mocking Star Trek. And there's the, the character who's supposed to be like the Vulcan knockoff. And like every time he goes anywhere, they want him to say it. Right? And he's like, I will say that stupid line. One more time. So anyway, so so like you think I'm gonna say it, right? You think I'm gonna say it? I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. I swear I won't ever rock on. Oh, I said it. <laughs>